Uh, good afternoon. I'm pleased to be convening this third meeting of this session between the conveners group and the First Minister. I'd like to welcome the First Minister to this meeting today and indeed uh, members of the public. Uh, this session gives conveners the opportunity to question the First Minister about the programme for government from the perspective of the Parliament's uh, committees. We need to finish, as you all know, by around 1.55, as chamber starts at 2 p.m. And this means, and I know you're all very disciplined, I'm looking at you all and you're agreeing with me, that time is very tight and therefore I'm going to allow five minutes for each convener and for the First Minister in the exchange. So it's a total of five minutes. Uh, moving uh, straight on, First Minister, do you want to make some opening remarks? No, in the interest of time, I'm happy to go straight into questions. Thank you very much. And I call, first of all, Claire Adamson, convener of Social Security. Ms Adamson, please. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, good afternoon, First Minister. Um, as convener of the Social Security Committee, our committee's um, main focus has been on the child poverty bill and the current social security bill that will, um, hopefully will be um, going through at stage three uh, deliberations next week. Um, as part of that, we have put on the face of the bill that social security has a role to play in reducing poverty. And I would just like to, to have um, further insight on, on what the government's programme will do to alleviate and hopefully eliminate child poverty in Scotland. Well, th thank you. I mean, firstly, I absolutely agree that Social Security does have a role to play. And actually, that was one of the central comments that the Independent Commission on Poverty and Inequality made in its report. It looked at work and earnings, housing costs, but also made the point that Social Security was uh, an area where we had to make sure that our actions were contributing towards the alleviation of poverty and the, the reduction of the inequality gap. The, the Scottish Government's programme spans all areas of government when it comes to tackling poverty and reducing inequality. Some of the areas of government work that are not badged necessarily as anti-poverty are nevertheless all about tackling the long-term drivers of poverty and inequality. So that would include our work to expand childcare, to close the educational attainment gap work to reduce the disability employment gap, the broad range of work we're doing around uh, the gender pay gap and gender inequality more generally, uh, the work around health inequalities and increasingly today uh, the work on adverse childhood experiences, recognising that many of the drivers of poverty and inequality uh, later in life are actually rooted in the early experiences of children. Uh, so all of that has a part to play but specifically in terms of the immediate remit of your committee, the child poverty uh, Act, uh, which sets targets for 2030 with interim targets for 2023. Uh, Macon is now the only part of the UK that has its binding statutory targets. And the delivery plan that was published just before the parliamentary recess, looking at those three areas I, I spoke about, that of course is backed by the Tackling Child Poverty Fund, £50 million over the, the course of the parliament. Uh, in addition, we've got the range of work to mitigate welfare cuts coming from Westminster that sees investment of about £100 million uh, every year. Uh, the biggest element of that, of course, is the, the mitigation of the bedroom tax. And then the work, uh, you mentioned the Social Security Bill that hopefully will pass uh, through Parliament next week, uh, to design our own social security system that very much has respect, dignity and a determination to tackle poverty at its heart. So that, that's a brief run through. I can go into more detail in any aspect of that. But the, the point I suppose I want to make is that our work to tackle poverty spans the, the short, immediate, medium and long term because tackling the longer term drivers of poverty is as important as mitigating its impacts. In fact, possibly more important than Im mitigating the impacts of poverty in the short term. Claire Adams. Thank you. Um, First Minister, the Social Security Committee took evidence this week from the Secretary of State. And while the, the Social Security bill and the powers that are coming to the parliament are substantive and, and perhaps one of the biggest new set of powers that are, are coming to this area but um, there were questions about the rollout of universal credit particularly um, highlighting some of the research that's been done that could show that a one parent family could be reduced income by up to £2,380 per year for, um, for a um, two-parent family, that could be nearly a thousand pounds a year, and obviously the things like the the two-child limit on tax credits. When it was planned, universal credit was supposed to to see no uh, detriment to anyone in this. But what challenges do you see ahead for services in Scotland as universal credit is rolled out? 
Mr. Enormous challenges, uh, to, to be blunt about it. I've got very uh, deep, profound concerns about the impact of the rollout of universal credit. I don't think the lessons from pilots are being sufficiently learned. I think there are inherent flaws in the design of universal credit and in the whole mechanisms uh, that lie behind the delivery of that. Taken uh, as a whole, of course, the, the cuts that are still to come to social security provision uh, at UK level are going to hit a, a significant number of people very hard. And you've given some of the uh, numbers that independent organisations have cited previously. That presents an immediate challenge for us because, and, and we saw this from the projections around child poverty or poverty generally that were published a few weeks ago, um, that is taking us in a direction around uh, poverty that is the opposite direction to the one we are trying to go in. So it, it's a headwind that is making what we are trying to do so much more difficult. It raises questions, questions that we hear all of the time in this parliament about the extent to which the Scottish Government can mitigate cuts that are coming from the UK. And while we have a definite role to play in using the powers we've got and the child poverty delivery plan I spoke about, one of the things it looks at is, is the idea of an income supplement, which we will do more work on over the next couple of years. But while these are substantial powers that are being transferred and we're determined to use them, they account for something like 15% of the total welfare budget. So significant, and even if we look at some of the limited powers we've got around uh, making modifications to universal credit, that involves getting the DWP to agree and to to agree to implement these things. So it makes the job that we're trying to do much more difficult, but I guess it also it makes it the need for us to use those powers cleverly and imaginatively and to their full extent all the more important, and that's what we are determined to do. But we shouldn't pretend that we can mitigate every impact of the welfare cuts that are coming from UK level, because we can't uh, until we get to a point where that entire budget is in our hands and we're not there yet or anywhere near it. Thank you. Margaret Mitchell, Convener of Justice. Good afternoon, First Minister. The Scottish Government hasn't committed to updating um, our legislation law and introducing legislation to do so, which would help um, clarify the boundaries of investigative journalism and also tackle online um, abuse. So would the First Minister be supportive of the Justice Committee using the powers that Scottish Parliament committees have but have been really used for um, the committee to introduce um, defamation as a committee bill? I don't think it's for me to say whether the committee should do that or not. I certainly would have uh, no, uh, no objections, and it's not for me to object to a committee wanting to bring forward its own bill. Um, as uh, the committee is aware, because I think there's been some uh, interaction between the government and the committee on this issue uh, previously, uh, the Scottish Law Commission has uh, recently concluded uh, a very thorough consideration around reforms uh, to defamation law. The government, uh, as... Uh, things stand just now, is, is considering the Scottish Law Commission report very carefully. Um, and we will hopefully in the not too distant future uh, say whether we would intend as a government to bring forward legislation or not. I think it's important that we consider uh, the Law Commission's report carefully. Um, this is a, a sensitive area. It's an area where for very understandable reasons there are strong uh, views and, and strong uh, feelings, but there are areas where there are differences of opinion. You know, the serious harm test, uh, contained in the, the, the draft bill, for example, has uh, attracted some criticism. There's an issue, uh, for example, about whether uh, there should be provision relating to def defamation of, of the deceased uh, and uh, an issue around uh, the, the correct length of a limitation period. So these are just some of the quite thorny issues that I think it's important to get right. So that's a consideration that the Scottish Government is going through. We will absolutely uh, continue to talk to the committee so that you understand our views and intentions around this. And if it comes to the point where the committee thinks it's appropriate to introduce a committee bill, I'm sure that's something that will get proper uh, consideration. Margaret Mitchell. Yeah, the committee has been quite keen to look at this legislation. And when we've looked into the process, we've discovered it really is quite, quite complex and quite daunting. So I wonder if she'd support looking at this to see if the process could be simplified, given there are very few bills ever being introduced by committees. And, and crucially, when she's looking at the legislative programme of the government, would she factor in time um, to allow committees such as Justice, which tends to be very heavily loaded with committee bills, to allow them to carry out this 
crucial function of our Scottish parliamentary party. First Minister. We've had this exchange before and, uh, when uh, the Deputy Presiding Officer was Chair of the Justice Committee. It's an issue that, that she raised uh, regularly with us. It's obviously for uh, committees to determine their own work programme. The government, yes, we do try to uh, consider the priorities of committees in considering our own legislative programme. But as I, I think in our last uh, exchange at the convener session, uh, we don't bring forward legislation just for the sake of it. The, the bills that the government brings forward are, are brought forward for a purpose because we consider they are necessary. But I mean, I suppose the short answer is we're always open to having a, a discussion. We do have ongoing discussions with committees about how to balance as, as well as we can. The government uh, demands on a committee's time uh, in terms of our legislative programme and the priorities that committees have themselves to do inquiries or indeed to bring forward committee bills. In terms of the, uh, as I understood it, and correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, I understood the first part of your question as being about the complexity of the, the process of committee bills rather than necessarily the complexity of the defamation, defamation uh, issue. Again, I'm not sure that's for the government necessarily to uh, pronounce on, um, but if there are ways in which the government can be helpful in, in looking at how committees can be better uh, supported or enabled to bring forward legislation, I, I, I would say we're open to that. But I think, I, I, as we all know, there will very quickly uh, be sensitivities about the government trying to encroach on the work or the procedures of committees. Thank you. I call Bob Doris, a convener of local government and communities. Mr Doris, please. Officer. First Minister, the outcome of the Scottish Government's public sector pay policy creates an expectation as to what local government workers might receive. The Scottish Government's own pay policy states that it is to act as a benchmark for all major public sector workforce groups across Scotland. Given that the 2018-2019 Scottish Government pay policy is to award a 3% increase to workers within its pay control earning under 36,500, how will the Scottish Government seek to both encourage at least a minimum 3% pay award for those in the same income band within local government and monitor the progress being made? Well, again, I, I would, I suppose, open my answer to this by recognising there's a, often a sensitivity here. Pay for local government employees is a matter for local councils, and uh, very often in this parliament and elsewhere, uh, the government, um, sometimes unfairly in my view, but uh, no doubt others would say uh, fairly, is criticised for uh, seeking to intervene or interfere in decisions that are rightfully decisions of individual local councils. Um, so I'll, in, in a going on to make my substantive remarks, I'll just make that general point. We, when we set our own public sector pay policy, we do recognise that inevitably sets a benchmark for the rest of the public sector. And we've set the pay policy we have uh, recommending 3% increases for staff over 36,500, uh, under 36,500 and 2% for those over, uh, knowing that that is then a benchmark that other parts of the public sector will be judged against. And we've set that policy because we think it's right that the 1% cap is lifted given the pressures on public sector workers uh, over the past few years and uh, particularly now that inflation is higher than it has been for uh, some time. Um, in terms of uh, setting our budget, we, we took account of that when we set our budget and particularly for the purposes of your question, the settlement for local government. So local government uh, has a real terms increase in its revenue budget in this financial year. Also, the ability that has been used uh, by local councils to increase the council tax by up to 3%, which of course is less than the average increase uh, elsewhere in the, the UK. That Those two things together gives uh, councils uh, extra revenue in this financial year of more than £200 million. And, and pay is one of the biggest inflationary pressures that councils face. You know, the, the pay bill, I think, is about 60% of the, the revenue budget of, of local government. Um, so that settlement, and I obviously, obviously don't speak for COSLA here, but presumably that settlement has been part of what has enabled COSLA uh, itself to set out a pay policy that is in line with the Scottish Government pay policy. Bob Doris. Um, first Minister, I'm glad you recognise pay as one of the significant pressures on, on, on local authorities and mentioning COSLA as well. So I wonder if the Scottish Government would consider in partnership with COSLA more closely monitoring local authority staff pay rates right across all 32 local authorities to map out where those disparities actually exist, as well as to better understand the potential financial impact of future Scottish Government pay policy benchmarks on local authorities going forward in future budget settlements. First Minister. Well, again, I suppose I'm, I'm just conscious here of uh, getting into territory where immediately some people, and understandably, and I'm, I suspect COSLA would be among them, would suggest it's not for 
national central government to monitor the decisions of individual local authorities. On the other hand, um, I do recognise the concerns that people will have if there's disparities. Different local authorities will perhaps reach different uh, settlements with particular groups of, of staff. So it's certainly something we'd be happy to discuss with COSLA um, and look to see whether there is work we could do jointly to uh, monitor might not be the, the best word to use in this context, but to look at the, whether there is a consistency across all 32 local authorities or whether there is action that would uh, encourage greater consistency. Thank you. Uh, Bruce Crawford, Convener of Finance and Constitution. Mr Crawford, please. Thank you, Deputy Prime Officer. Uh, good afternoon, First Minister. Uh, as the Convener of the Finance and Constitution Committee, you might understand that I'm concerned about the timescale around issues to do with the EU withdrawal bill. And I wonder if the First Minister could confirm that negotiations between the Scottish and UK governments are still ongoing in regard to the EU withdrawal bill, given that the UK government require consent from this Parliament. And given that the EU withdrawal bill is fast approaching the last stage of scrutiny in the Lords, uh, and now the UK government has referred the Scottish EU continuity bill, as I call it, um, to the Supreme Court, despite the overwhelming vote here in support of its passing, and can you update us on where these negotiations currently stand, please? Uh, I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> um, can I, you, you mentioned the referral to the Supreme Court that was uh, announced by the UK government yesterday. I, I think um, it's fair to say I, I deeply regret that decision. Um, I, I've heard over the past number of weeks since this parliament passed the continuity bill, it described variously in the media as my bill or the SNP's bill. It was a bill that was passed by the overwhelming majority of members of this parliament. It's the Scottish Parliament's continuity bill. It was done under emergency procedures, but I think it's fair to say, and uh, I think I, I'm, I'm telling you something that you were uh, very closely involved in, it had a, a very, uh, I think, significant degree of scrutiny. So the Westminster government had a decision to make whether to respect the decision the Scottish Parliament arrived at or not to respect it and unfortunately they opted uh, not to and refer to the Supreme Court and you know I, I mention that because it is it does have a bearing on the the spirit of the negotiations that we're currently engaged in um, you know I think to some extent the UK government is asking the Scottish government and ultimately the Scottish Parliament to take on trust that the process of Brexit will not be used to ride roughshod over the powers of this parliament. And I don't think it helps build that trust when we have uh, decisions taken by a clear majority in this parliament referred to court in the way that we saw yesterday. So I, I regret that, but I'll, I'll put that to, to one side at the moment. In terms of the negotiations, they are ongoing. Um, they continue. I, I, I don't think I'm betraying any secrets when I say time is, is getting short and, and the clock is ticking on this. Um, we continue to talk. Uh, I think progress uh, is being made, but we're not there yet. And whether we will see enough progress to allow me as First Minister to recommend that the Parliament consents to the withdrawal bill is still an open question. I've been very, very clear that the issue of consent of this Parliament is fundamental, and it's a fundamental issue of principle as far as I'm concerned. And, and my, you know, what I will have to do when we get to the end of the negotiation and we've got as far as we will go is judge whether uh, this Parliament's powers, uh, however benignly the UK government might want to express all of this, I'll have to make a judgment, the Scottish government will have to make a judgment about whether uh, ultimately the powers of this Parliament could be constrained, you know, even for a limited period, uh, without the consent of this Parliament. So I've, I've been very clear that's a key issue, and we're not yet at a point where I think we would uh, be able to recommend agreement, but we continue to negotiate in good faith. Bruce Crawford. First Minister, obviously the government need to make its mind up, so, but so will the Finance and Constitution Committee need to make its mind up about its final report into whether to recommend consent on the EU withdrawal bill or not. And therefore, I just wonder if you could let us know what potentially might happen next, because timescales are important here in terms of how we, as a committee, come to a conclusion. What would your best advice be in regard to timescales in that regard? First Minister. I think we are, so I'm not going to give you a specific date because it's not, it's not within my 
uh, ability to do that quite at this point. But I think it's fair to say we are reaching the end game of this. And we know this, the stage the withdrawal bill is at in terms of being at, at report stage in the Lords. Uh, so we would probably, over the next couple of weeks, need to see uh, this come to an agreement or not. So we are talking now, um, you know, more like days rather than weeks, but uh, that's the kind of uh, sphere we're in. There have been further discussions this week. I, I think there is uh, an intention to have potentially a further uh, meeting of the, the ministers uh, dealing with this perhaps next week, although uh, to the best of my knowledge, when I came into this meeting, that's not been absolutely finalised yet. But we are definitely getting towards uh, the, the end game. I, I hope, um, I genuinely hope we can reach agreement, but when there's inevitably when there's pretty fundamental issues of principle involved um the bar for agreement is is is, is not off, always easy to overcome um, and even when you know lots of people on both sides are trying very hard to to reach agreement so i hope we can get there uh, but we're not there yet thank you joanne lamont convener of public petitions Ms. lamont please thank you very much uh, deputy presiding officer i mean Obviously, the Public Petitions Committee is unusual in that it deals with um, a massive range of issues, and I don't intend asking a specific petition, um, since that would be a test as much for your memory as mine. Um, but what is true, and I've, I've tried to look at some of the themes around that come out from public petitions, bearing in mind that these are entirely driven by individuals who and campaign groups who want to petition Parliament, there is a common theme about people feeling let down by the system and that the institutions that they try to get help from don't respond to them. And I'd be interested in your, your outlook on how you think that, that can be addressed. But more specifically, given you know, um, 2018, as you know, is the year of young people, um, I want to ask specifically about how the rights of children and young people have been reflected in the Public Petitions Committee over the last period. We've had a number of petitions across areas such as education, health and justice that raise issues that are fundamental about how the rights of children and young people are protected. There are some very tragic examples um, in the petition system currently, uh, for example, about how young people <coughs> access mental health services. So I wonder, first of all, do you have a response to this question about how do we deal with systems that don't respond and people are reduced to coming to something like the Petitions Committee? But also, how do you, in government, um, ensure there is an assessment of the impact of anything you do on the rights of children and young people? First Minister. Okay, uh, th there's a lot in that question, a lot of important stuff in that question, so I'll try to, if, if I may, unpack it a little bit. Um, the first thing to say is, as a government, we pay very close attention to the petitions that come to the Petitions Committee, not just, obviously, we pay close attention to the individual issues that are brought forward, but as you would expect, we pay close attention to the themes that are emerging from individual petitions. So I don't want to give too many statistics, but for example, if we look at all of the petitions uh, that have come forward uh, in session five, the session to date, uh, three quarters of them relate to just four broad topical areas. So health and social care account for 40%, followed by justice, uh, about 16%, environment and rural, 10%, and transport, another 10%. Children and young people uh, would be the next in that list, about 6%. But as you rightly say, a lot of the health petitions will be uh, particularly around mental health, things that are particularly important to uh, young people. So we, we try to have an oversight of the themes so that we are uh, not just responding to the individual issues, but picking up general uh, patterns that are emerging and try to deal with that systematically where it's uh, public bodies that are accountable to the Scottish uh, Government, whether that's health boards or, or other public bodies. Um, in terms of children and young people in particular, obviously this is the year of young people and it's a, a theme going across uh, all parts of government to try to see issues uh, through the lens of a young person, even when they're kind of issues that are not normally seen in that way. And the petitions that come forward to your committee uh, are not the only way, but are one way, I think, of helping us to do that. Mental health, to just use that example because it's one you raised, we know that as mental health stigma reduces and demand raises, uh, demand increases, 
access to mental health services as well as mental health uh, or mental ill health prevention is becoming more and more important. But I think both from petitions and from our other evidence, we know that's a particular issue for young people. And I think the prevention issue, uh, certainly I know from the young people I speak to, is particularly important. So I wouldn't want to say that petitions is the only thing that allows us to uh, assess and react in a, a way that is more systematic, but it is certainly an important part of that process. Joanne Lamont. I mean, I on the, the, the question of young people and, and mental health, I would ask you to, to look at a fear that has been expressed in, in our committee in evidence that because of pressures on GPs, there's a possibility that young people don't get offered the other services they might need before there may be an offer of um, a prescription. And that's it's highly sensitive issue, and I'm sure you'll be aware of it, but I just would, would, would urge that you would maybe look at that. But I suppose just as a general point, um, I think it might be useful when the Public Petition Committee is looking to the government for a response that there is specific information given around the impact of um, what you're doing around children and young people's rights. And I think that would be helpful extra information to give to the committee. First Minister. Okay, I'm, I'm certainly happy to take that away as a, a specific suggestion. Um, you know, I, I hope your committee, I mean, I appreciate there won't always necessarily be a, a consensus of view on the subject matter of petitions, but I hope your committee uh, believes that the government responds positively and proactively and, and in detail to requests for information. So we will look at whether almost routinely we can add into a response on any petition a, a perspective from uh, uh, young people. It may be that it's not relevant on absolutely everything, but uh, we, we will certainly take that away and look at how that is best done. On the mental health point, yes, I, I think it is important that we, and we are very aware of that as a, a risk. One of the things, without going off at a tangent here too much, that I'm particularly uh, keen to uh, build into our approach to mental health is that while, yes, people who need appointments at GPs, they should get those appointments at, at GPs, but we have to get much more upstream to use the that terminology with mental health so that it's not necessarily always the case that somebody presenting with a mental health issue has to go to a GP or another part of the, the formal health service. That is all about, and this is something that many members have raised, about getting more mental health prevention support into schools and other settings where young people find themselves. So that's very much part of the, the mental health approach that we are, are keen to take. Thank you. I call Graham Day, uh, Convener of Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform. Mr Day, please. Uh, thank you. First Minister, can I explore with you the extent to which the advice of the UK Climate Change Committee is sought and then followed by the Scottish Government in shaping climate change policy? First Minister. Well, the, the UK Committee on Climate Change uh, is the uh, statutory independent advisor to the Scottish Government. I, I think it was the, the 2009 Act uh, of this Parliament that established it as such. So we are we're obliged to take into account the advice of uh, the Committee on, on Climate Change, and, and we do that. It will not be the only factor we take into account when coming to decisions. Obviously, this is particularly pertinent and relevant just now as we come to uh, what are are not easy and actually finely balanced judgments about the extent to uh, which we set uh, targets in our next climate change uh, bill. Uh, there's obviously, uh, we consulted on a, a target, the 90% target that the UK Committee on Climate Change said was at the outside edge of what was achievable. We are uh, being pressed uh, rightly and understandably by uh, many organisations to go for net zero uh, and net zero is our aspiration what we are thinking about carefully just now given that when you put something in legislation you have to have a, a path to deliver it is the extent to which and the, the time scale in which that aspiration can be translated into uh, legislation given some of the unique nature of the legislation that we have in Scotland. Going with us because obviously the uh, climate bill will be coming to my committee, and I, I understand you won't want to reveal what's in the bill and the decision you've taken around the target. But I wonder if we could maybe explore a little further how the government is going to balance that expert opinion you've had, which, as you say, is suggests that a 90% target is at the ambitious end of what's achievable, set against the understandable aspirations of the environmental lobby. Uh, how are you going to do that in practice? Well, we're looking very carefully at that just now because this is a... So, if I can be very clear, my aspiration is the same as the environmental lobby. I want to see us get to a net zero position 
as quickly as possible. And some argue for that to be 2040, some 2050, some would argue probably earlier than 2040, but that's, the, that's our position. The question is, because right now, we could not credibly say we can set out a pathway from here to there. Now, those in the environmental lobby would say, yeah, but that, you know, that shouldn't stop you because the science and the technology is changing. And I recognize that. I suppose the difficult thing comes when you're translating that aspiration into binding legislation. And there's two points that, you know, because other countries, some other countries, Sweden, for example, are often held up as well. They've already committed to this. There's actually two points uh, of difference between our legislation in Scotland and the approach taken by many other countries. There are very few countries that have binding statutory targets like we do. And there are fewer still that have binding annual targets. So our, our targets are actually very tough. We also uh, only count domestic measures towards our targets. Other countries, often the ones that are cited, will use international credits. We don't do yeah. that. So we've got to, if we're going to put something in law that we are on an annual basis uh, measured against, we have to be able to look people in the eye and say, well, how, you know, we know how we can deliver that. So that's the... That's the process we're going through just now. Obviously, the, the bill will be published um, soon, uh, before the, the summer recess. And it's, it's not an easy judgment, but the, the, the difference here is not in aspiration. It's just about the, the extent to which and the timescale over which that aspiration can be converted into binding annual targets. OK, thank you. Thank you. Gordon Lindhurst, Convener of Economy, Jobs and Fair Work. Mr Lindhurst, please. Um, thank you, Convener. First Minister, I think you'll be aware that the Economy Committee is undertaking an inquiry into the performance of the Scottish economy. And one of the recurring themes that seems to arise and evidence arose again yesterday before the committee is the issue of the cluttered landscape uh, when it comes to business support. Uh, if we think of uh, the different schemes available, Scottish Enterprise High and Business Gateway. Now, uh, what can the Scottish Government do to ensure that alignment or a coherent uh, setup of business support is available to businesses? How can, how can the Scottish Government bring this about quickly? Well, the, the key thing we have done uh, and is now getting underway, of course, is the establishment of the strategic board. Um, I mean, I paid very close attention to the Fraser of Islander report just a few weeks ago. Um, certainly, having a streamlined a landscape as possible is always something we've sought to do. Uh, I guess, though, when you try to streamline a landscape, you quickly run into uh, people, including, uh, dare I say it, members of this parliament who don't want you to streamline a particular organisation or particular strategy that they uh, would rather you keep. So it's easy to say, but as we found out, if you remember in the early days of the, the process towards the strategic board, uh, we wanted perhaps to go a little bit further, um, not to uh, compromise the existence of High, for example, but to have a bit of a harder alignment uh, between organisations. And that was uh, you know, pretty strongly resisted across the parliament. So this is easy to say to a government, but those uh, who say it, have to be prepared to not just will the ends, but sometimes will the means uh, along the way. And that, that's where it gets much more difficult. The strategic board, though, I think will do a, a lot to bring uh, that strategic alignment. You know, if, we, if you look at spend on enterprise and skills in Scotland, it tops £2 billion a year. Uh, we need to make sure we're getting maximum bangs for those bucks. And so the strategic board, uh, which Nora Senior is chairing, is about making sure that all of those enterprise and skills agencies are, are uh, actually, not just uh, in theory, but actually moving in the right direction where there's an overall uh, strategy. So I think that will help uh, significantly and I'm absolutely sure that Nora Senior is the right person to drive that given uh, her own experience, not least with the, the Chambers of Commerce more recently. Um, just looking at another area of the committee's remit, energy, um, I think probably we're all agreed that the renewable energy um, programme should be progressed. And uh, I, I want to ask the First Minister, do you agree that part of that has to be um, both national and local government working together to progress that? And um, uh, getting to the point, if we look at the, the Inch Cape application called in by the Scottish Government before East Lothian Council could even take a view on it, um, does that show respect for local democracy 
Uh, and indeed, does this build trust? Because a lot of people will say it's not, and ultimately that may not be of assistance to the renewable energy strategy. Well, I, I should say, first of all, uh, Inchcape, as we know, is a life planning application, so I'm, I'm not going to go too far into the, the detail of that. Uh, the planning minister set out in Parliament yesterday, though, the reasons because of the strategic uh, or potential strategic importance of uh, that particular development that's placed within uh, National Planning Framework 3, why that call-in happened. But, you know, you, yes, I believe that, to answer your question, national and, and, and local government have to work together. But again, this comes down to if we have a, a national strategic ambition, and we're talking here about renewables, then we have to make sure that we are doing the things as a country that enable that ambition to be delivered. Uh, you know, I was uh, at BIFAB yesterday. Uh, the Scottish Government worked really hard to get a, a deal in place that could give BIFAB a, a bright future. Um, but whether BIFAB has a bright future or not will not entirely, but in part depend on our ability to get some of these big uh, renewable energy developments uh, at, up, uh, up and running and into construction. So there are always going to be tensions here, but that's why we have the, the national planning framework. That's why we have issues that are seen as being of national importance. And I should say, just as a final point in this, and, and the statistics bear me out, I won't bore you with statistics, uh, but the statistics bear me out on this. The Scottish Government uses its call-in powers uh, under the planning legislation very, very sparingly. It's not something we do uh, lightly. It's not something uh, we overuse. Uh, we do that sparingly, and it is a part of the process that's there for that purpose. So it's a bit like your first question, um, and, and I know this, I should say, I know this to some extent is, is the nature of opposition. It's if you want to pressure governments to meet these big national objectives, uh, as you should, there comes a point where you can't then always be opposing the things that are necessary to allow us to achieve those big national objectives, whether that's on streamlining the landscape or some of the things that have to be done to allow us to meet the renewables potential we've got. Uh, Christina McKelvey, Convener of Equality and Human Rights. Ms McKelvey, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. Good afternoon. Uh, first, Minister, First Minister, you'll be aware that the Equality Human Rights Committee has looked at the issue of gypsy travellers over the past couple of years, and we know that they remain a marginalised group. Educational attainment and health inequalities and poverty all remain major issues. And when we heard from young David Donaldson at Committee on Human Rights Day last year, he said that the discrimination faced by the gypsy traveller community is the last acceptable form of racism in Scotland. And I, I know that you would agree with me that that's something that we don't want to countenance. How, how do we reassure David Donaldson and the other members of the gypsy traveller community that for them, this form of racism is, will be a thing of the past? And can you tell me about some of the initiatives that your government are taking in order to tackle this issue? Well, it's an important issue, and I think it is a remaining area of quite serious discrimination and, and disadvantage that flows from that discrimination that we really have a, a moral obligation to tackle. And the work that your committee is doing, I think, is important in that regard, continuing to draw attention uh, to that. And I know the current human rights inquiry is looking specifically at uh, the, the gypsy traveller community as part of that. I mean, we've got a range of work underway and you will be familiar with uh, much of this work. Um, we've uh, committed extra funding over uh, the 2017 to 2020 period, uh, one and a half million pounds uh, to organisations that provide support to uh, gypsy traveller communities and that includes uh, for example uh, a flexible learning program which uh, is designed to meet the needs of gypsy travellers living on sites and uh, that in fact was one of the things uh, we announced in the child poverty delivery plan. Uh, we are also looking specifically at issues like education and uh, health and the disadvantage and inequalities that exist there. Uh, I think there has been progress in that regard, but I, I would be one of the first to admit that there is work still to do. Uh, I think most centrally, though, the, the ministerial working group that has been established that is chaired by Angela Constance, but it includes ministers uh, from all areas that really touch on uh, this issue, is, is really important. Uh, the group has already 
held a meeting, I think its second meeting is due to be held uh, next month when it's got a particular focus on education and the, the young gypsy traveller that you uh, mentioned in your question, uh, David Donaldson, I believe is uh, giving uh, evidence to uh, that group. So that will be a, an important opportunity. I think after education, the, the work plan of the group is to focus on employment and uh, health and it is intended to produce a report by June 2019, setting out some of the actions that we will take based on the review work that it's done. But I think what your committee is doing will continue to helpfully feed into the work that the government is doing. Yeah, Tina McKelvey. Thanks very much. First Minister, one of the, the, the things that I've picked up quite quickly was the flexible learning programme and how that can work. Um, and I'm keen to know how the government will work with local authorities in order to deliver that. But I'm also keen to know um, and a very particular aspect of this is primary school children, gypsy traveller children, who then don't go to high school, in particular girls, and whether there'll be anything in the flexible learning programme that will allow that continuation of education, which in most cases is what's most important in order to deal with some of the issues around about health yeah. inequalities and poverty and lifting people out of poverty and into better employment opportunities? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, just to, to give, I suppose, two uh, quick responses uh, to that. The, through the flexible learning programme, working with local authorities is essential to that, given the, the, the primary role of local authorities in education provision. The, your second point is fundamental. Uh, you know, we see generally education has been one of the roots out of, of poverty and one of the, the ways in which we, we tackle inequality. And that has to apply uh, to everybody and uh, the, the particular issues that you've identified within the Gypsy Traveller community. As I said, the ministerial group is focusing on education at its next session. I'm sure the issue, particularly with girls, uh, yeah. continuing in education beyond primary school will be one of the things they're looking at. But I will, uh, from this meeting, uh, just make sure that that's very firmly on their agenda. And uh, hopefully that process will allow us to focus on some of the actions that will help to, to tackle that Thank particular you. issue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I call Claire Hockey, Convener of Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments. Ms thank Hockey, you, please. Convener, uh, and thank you, First Minister, for joining us. Um, as you'll be aware, the uh, Standards Committee is looking at some <coughs> of the recommendations which came from the Commission on Parliamentary Reform. Um, so I'd, I'd like you to see the Government's uh, opinion specifically on some of the recommendations on Members' Bills. Um, the Commission concluded the scope for greater collaborative working between MSPs and the Government to take forward backbenchers' legislative um, proposals. Do you agree with that conclusion? Um, I agree that we should uh, try to achieve greater collaboration between Government and, and Members when Members' bills are being contemplated. That said, I, I think there is fairly good collaboration already, so I don't, I don't think this is an area where... Uh, it, you know, things are, are in need of radical overhaul. I'm aware of the, the Commission on Parliamentary Reform, uh, the recommendation it made to effectively remove the rule that says when government decides to legislate, then a, a member's bill would stop. Um, I, 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 don't, I think it's fair to say I don't have really, really strong views one way or the other on this, so we'll be interested in the committee's deliberations. Um, I suppose a few things I would say would be uh, the government doesn't, a bit, like, bit like the previous answer I gave, the government doesn't use that uh, particularly often. I think, in fact, the current government has only done it twice, which is effectively step in and take over uh, a member's bill. And that, those uh, occasions were, I think, the lobbying bill and the human trafficking bill. So it's not something that happens particularly often, which makes me think that while, I, as I say, I don't have really strong views on this, the the Commission recommendation is maybe a solution sort of searching for a problem that doesn't really exist, which makes me think I'm not absolutely convinced that there is a, an overwhelming case to take away that rule completely. It may be that there's some modifications that could be made to it. And one thing that I, I do think uh, perhaps merits uh, a bit of examination is around timescales. So if, if the government did say, well, you know, we intend to legislate here, thereby taking away a member's right to take a bill, that there should be some time scale in which the government has to do it or not do it, in which case the member's bill would come back to, to the fore. So, yeah, I think there are issues there that merit examination, but whether this is a fundamental problem in how the system is operating, I'm not convinced I've heard the evidence of that. Thank you. Um, if the Scottish Government does take on a legislative proposal then first raised by a backbencher, how, how would it involve the member in the development of that bill? 
Well, as I say, in the life of this government, it's only happened twice, and so maybe the, the members who first proposed those bills are better able to, to give a perspective on that than, than I am. Um, I think from memory that would be what, Neil Finlay and Jenny Mara, I think. Um, but what we would seek to do and what I hope we did in these circumstances would be to continue to talk to the member in terms of the, the process of consultation, the process of uh, you know, agreeing the, the terms of, of the bill. It's not necessarily the case there would be complete agreement there, but we would certainly seek to continue to involve the member as the, the consultation and the process of the bill developed. You've reminded me that I should have given Jenny Mara's apologies. She was unable to attend today, so that's now on the record. Uh, I call Graham Simpson, convener of Delegated Powers and Law Reform, please. Thanks, convener. Um, I think I asked you a, a similar question um, in a previous meeting, but you may have a, a, an update for us uh, at this time. Uh, I'm looking for an update on the preparations for making the secondary legislation um, needed as a, a result of leaving the European Union. Um, can you give an indication of how many instruments that will need to be made and whether these will all need to be laid before exit day? Um, and how do you intend to balance this potential? It could be a mountain of work, actually, um, against your own programme of domestic legislation. Well, it will be a mountain of work, and um, I would rather it was work we weren't having to do, because inevitably it will divert uh, attention from things that the Parliament might prefer to be doing. Um, I'm, I'm always slightly nervous when somebody says I asked you this question at the last uh, session, <laughs> just in case I don't give you the same answer as I gave you at the last session. Um, we, we don't have, and I, I'm sure conveners will understand this, I can't give you a specific answer to the question because we don't yet know, we, we don't yet know the, the precise terms on which the UK will leave the EU. We don't know what the future relationship is going to be. So there are some uh, questions that remain to be answered to allow us to answer that question uh, definitively. I can give you estimates and, and the estimates we're working on. So the UK government estimates that between 800 and 1,000 regulations will be needed in the UK Parliament and the Scottish government's current working assumption, and, but I would stress that it's our current working assumption that's subject to change, is that there will be around 300 in instruments needed in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, but we're not going to be able to... Uh, you know, sort of finalise that estimate until certain other things have completed. Um, there is work, and I'm sure you're aware of this, uh, there's work already underway between the government and parliamentary officials on drafting protocols that will ensure there is clarity about what uh, Brexit secondary legislation will be laid uh, so that there is clarity as early as possible on the quantum, but also, and I think this bit is just as important actually, so that there is clarity as early as possible on how significant each of the different instruments are, yeah. so that that allows the committees to start to plan their work, but also make sure that they're applying a proportionate level of scrutiny, because, well, it kind of stands to reason, not every single regulation uh, and piece of secondary legislation is going to be as significant as every other one. So yeah. I think committees will want to apply scrutiny that is proportionate and based on the complexity or the significance of, of the instrument. So, you know, I'm sorry I can't give you definitive uh, information on this. That is our current working assumption, but we will continue to liaise very closely with the Parliament as that picture becomes clearer. OK, no, that, that's, that's actually very useful. Um, a bit of good news for you. Um, you will be pleased to know that we uh, yesterday agreed to write to Joe Fitzpatrick uh, to commend him and uh, government officials for the lowest quarter on record of SSIs, having no technical points raised on them. Um, we, we very much hope this trend will continue because it helps me sleep at night. Um, but um, you may also want to know the committee has, uh, has had long-running discussions with Mr Fitzpatrick and Derek Mackay on the need to consolidate uh, the council tax reduction scheme um, we want to make sure that the law is clear and accessible to everyone who needs to use it. Um, but in the case of these regulations, they've been amended 13 times. So they've become really uh, increasingly complex. And we think it could now be a barrier to those who wish to use the, the law. Uh, now, Mr Mackay uh, has become a bit of a pen friend to me. Um, he said in February that the committee would be updated on ways forward his, his words, ways forward for the scheme in the late summer, but he hasn't confirmed any particular date 
by which they may be consolidated. So I wonder if you could uh, perhaps commit to actually consolidating them and, and give me some sort of time scale as to when that might happen. Uh, well, uh, that was a question in two parts, a, a sort of, you know, good bit and bad, but um, I'm glad you've noticed a, an improvement in the uh, number of SSIs without uh, flaws. We work very hard on that, and uh, I'm sure Joe Fitzpatrick will be delighted to receive your letter. I hope it doesn't mean he's uh, asking for a promotion. Uh, I should put on the public <laughs> record he's not getting one at this stage. Um, and at this stage, I, I don't want to take all hope uh, away from him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, on the, the second point about council, I mean, I know this is a long running discussion yeah, between yes. government and your committee. Um, if, if I can be can I, as diplomatic as possible, I don't think we entirely agree with the views of the committee on this, and, but Derek Mackay is, uh, and we'll continue to try to see if we can find some common ground. Uh, consolidation, well, I mean, there's been two issues, as I understand it recurring issues about V-rays of these regulations, which we simply don't agree with, um, and then this issue about consolidation. Um, I think it's important to say consolidation, while it may have some benefits, I don't, uh, I don't deny that, it wouldn't fundamentally change how the scheme works, and it wouldn't change uh, how much of a council tax reduction somebody receives. And the regulations are implemented by local authorities who are familiar with the regulations and the various amendments. And the system operates effectively. There's no there's no suggestion that the system is not working well. And even if we do consolidate, and we'll continue to consider a way forward there, it's likely that they would, the consolidated text would almost immediately need updating again, particularly as the new devolved benefits are established. So I'm, I'm not convinced, and we are not convinced, this is as big a, an issue as the committee may quite legitimately thinks it is, but we will continue to have that discussion and see if we can find an agreed way forward. At least he's smiling. Uh, <laughs> I call Edward Mountain, Convener, Rural Economy and Connectivity, please. Good afternoon, First Minister. As you know, the REC Committee are currently involved in, in, in an inquiry into agriculture, and in particular salmon farming, an industry that is vitally important to the Scottish economy, in the same way that wild fisheries, in which I have a declared interest, are as well. The published a clear report into the environmental impacts of salmon farms suggests that the status quo is not acceptable. Do you and the Scottish Government have a view on that published report? Well, we're considering the Environment Committee's report very carefully. Um, as you know, it uh, concluded in its view that further development and expansion of aquaculture should be predicated on resolving what it considers to be some current environmental issues and fundamentally on the basis of a precautionary approach and it concluded that in its view the current consenting and regulatory framework it wasn't adequate to address the environmental issues so we're looking and, and considering carefully we would argue that we do uh, follow a precautionary approach already but we are open to uh, ways in which the the, the regulatory and uh, consenting system can be approved. I think it's important here that we, we strike a balance. You alluded to the fact that aquaculture is hugely important to our economy. It's worth over £600 million a year in uh, gross value added to the Scottish economy. I think um, at last count there's around 12,000 jobs dependent on aquaculture. So it's important that we support the industry to, to develop and to grow, but we must do that sustainably. Um, and because the it's an industry that depends on the environment, so we must make sure it has due uh, regard to sustainability and environmental protection. Um, I hesitate to go off too much uh, into the issue of sea lice, um, but that's obviously a particular issue here, and there is a considerable amount of work that the industry itself has been doing there. Um, but we will continue to, to consider the environment report. We'll be very interested in the work your committee is doing to review that and, and seek to work with industry to make sure we get this balance right in the future. Thank, thank you, First Minister. I mean, I think the two key points that you picked up there are sustainability and the precautionary approach. And therefore, based on that, the continued expansion of salmon farming, which continues as we speak, before the REC Committee have completed their report, and you and the government have had a chance, which you have said you want to do to consider both reports. Do you think that's wise and precautionary and sustainable? Or do you think there should be a pause while the committee and the government get a chance to come to the bottom of the problem? Well, I mean, the, the world really stands still 
while you know reports are important though they are uh, are are underway, so it's important that we we build that precautionary principle into to everything that's happening, and that's what we're seeking to do. Um, I think there is more that the aquaculture uh, sector can do to better demonstrate its current progress in some key issues. Um, and we do, and we've recognised this, we need to look again at making sure we've got the balance right in terms of regulation. Uh, so we are working with the sector. We will uh, work, obviously, with... Uh, agencies like SEPA as well as the external scientific bodies uh, to, to pick up the pace of that work. Um, there are a range of Scottish Government initiatives, funded initiatives, for example, like the, the development of the Scottish Shelf model, which is important in, in this regard. So it is, it is about a balance. I, I absolutely, the environment is of huge importance in everything we do, but particularly for a sector that depends on the, the health of our environment, it's particularly important. Uh, but on the other side of this, there is enormous economic benefit from the sector. So these, these balances are not always straightforward, and you know this, uh, given your, your interest in this area, uh, these are not always easy balances to strike, but it's important that we continue the work we're doing to, to get that right. Thank you. Call Joan McAlpine, Convener of Culture, Tourism, European and External Relations, and that's a mouthful. Ms McAlpine. Uh, thank you, and I'm only going to concentrate, concentrate on one aspect of my committee's work, which is culture. Uh, good, good afternoon, First Minister. There were signs of relief all round when the Scottish Government came together with the private sector to find a funding package to save the Scottish Youth Theatre. Uh, you'll be aware that the Scottish Youth Theatre was refused funding uh, for the second time in Creative Scotland's regular funding process and this time the regular funding process came under severe criticism not least because some decisions were reversed uh, without explanation. The Chief Executive of Creative Scotland and the former Acting Chair came before my committee and admitted that the process was flawed. Now while of course it's absolutely correct that these decisions are taken independently of government, do you have a view on that process and how it was being dealt with? Um, obviously, I have, I have views on it. I mean, let me, if I can deal with the Scottish Youth Theatre issue, first of all, I mean, the Scottish Youth Theatre uh, didn't have RFO funding, so it, it, and that was the case in, in the past two years. So it wasn't an organisation that, that lost its RFO funding. Um, it didn't succeed in its application, and there would be many, many organisations in that position who applied to be regularly funded organisations and, and didn't succeed. Um, but given the importance of the Scottish Youth Theatre, particularly in the year of young people, we were, and I articulated this at a session of FMQs a few weeks ago, we were determined to see whether we could get a package of funding together to allow it to continue its work while we work with them to try to uh, help them be more sustainable in the future. And, you know, there are uh, views, have uh, been views expressed about the Scottish Youth Theatre, which, while it does fantastic work, there's uh, room for it to be... Uh, to, to extend its reach and to be more accessible to more young people. So the funding package that was put together by the Scottish Government and uh, the private sector allows the breathing space for that to happen and hopefully we'll come out of uh, the other end of that with uh, a sustainable future for the, the Scottish Youth Theatre. In terms of the, the RFO process more generally, I mean, I, as you know, um, we increased the culture budget by 10%. I think we, we put six more than £6 million into the budget to compensate for the loss of lottery funding. So that allowed Creative Scotland to fund, broadly speaking, the same number of organisations through the RFO process, which is not the only funding stream of, of Creative Scotland. Um, some came in for the first time, some dropped out, but the overall number is broadly the same. It's always going to be difficult for organisations that, that lose funding and there are transitional arrangements in place. Obviously, the uh, Creative Scotland did reflect on some of the, uh, the, the decisions they'd made. They put some more funding in to uh, allow organisations that had initially not got funding to be funded. Um, in terms of my view, I think Creative Scotland, well, firstly, it is a process that's independent of ministers, and Parliament decided that. That's part of the, the legislation that underpins this, so ministers can intervene in these decisions. But I would expect, and, you know, I... Uh, would have indeed uh, discussed uh, the need for this directly with, with Creative Scotland uh, as part of a, a routine meeting, uh, I would expect them to listen carefully to the views that have been expressed about the process. And I think they've said it openly that they are thinking about that 
uh, and looking ahead to how they improve that process over the, the longer term. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, if I could go back to the youth arts funding in particular. At UK level, there is a national youth theatre that receives portfolio funding from the Arts Council England. And we do have various national companies that are funded in Scotland through various ad, ad hoc uh, funding streams. But when SYT uh, wrote to me, they told me that Creative Scotland said there was no strategy for national youth performing companies. And I wondered if you thought that there should be in the same way as that there is for our national companies like Scottish Opera and Scottish Ballet. And um, more broadly, I wonder if, if this, what your view is in a, a, a how the arts is treated for young people in comparison for, with sport, for example. I mean, in sport, we agree that every, every young person should be able to access it for their own well-being. But we also agree that there are very talented young people, as we've seen at the Commonwealth Games, that we invest in uh, through elite sport. But when it comes to culture, uh, yeah, we agree that everyone should have access to culture for their own well-being. But is there enough emphasis on the most talented young people who have the most potential? Uh, and perhaps do you think we should maybe be looking at that again and treat it in the same way as we treat sport? Okay, I, I think there were two questions in there. Firstly, the one about, you know, should we have uh, youth national performance companies that are directly funded? Um, I do think that's something we should uh, consider. As, as I understand it, and I, my apologies to them if I'm getting this wrong, that the Scottish Youth Theatre don't necess necessarily see that as an immediate uh, solution to the position they're in. But I think over time, it is something that we should uh, think about and consider. And perhaps the process that we will uh, go through with the Scottish Youth Theatre over the next year or so uh, is an opportunity to do that uh, as we try to find a, a sustainable future for them. In terms of your second question, I'm, I'm very, very sympathetic to that, actually. I mean, obviously, we have uh, the Time to Shine programme uh, through Creative Scotland. There's work on underway just now in terms of the refreshed youth uh, arts strategy, which will publish in the not-too-distant future. Uh, we've also seen uh, Creative Scotland establish uh, traineeships uh, for particularly talented young people, which I think is a step in the direction that you're talking about. So yes, a bit like sport, we want everybody to be able to, I'm you know, a passionate believer that participation in, in arts and culture for everybody is a, a really important part of the health and well-being of the country, um, as well as individuals. But yes, of course, we need to, to also make sure that in terms of the, the participants, the, the people that are providing, producing, uh, performing, the really talented people, we're giving them the support they, they merit. And I think the traineeship programme that Creative Scotland has is perhaps a good foundation for looking at what more we can do there too. Thank you. I call Lewis MacDonald, Convener of Health and Sport. Mr MacDonald, please. Thank you very much. The Health and Sport Committee has been inquiring into the governance of the NHS in Scotland, uh, looking, for example, at issues of health board leadership and democratic accountability, and also at the development of new spheres of governance, for example, at regional level and also uh, locally at integration joint board level. I'm sure the First Minister will recognise that the current crisis at NHS Tayside has highlighted a number of these concerns uh, very sharply. Uh, your loss of confidence clearly in the local leadership of that particular board, but also uh, issues around accountability, around the relationship between non-executive and executive directors. And also potentially because your government's response to that has involved uh, other boards, whether that has implications for regionalisation as well. So I'd be very interested, First Minister, to know what conclusions you've drawn for the governance of the wider NHS in Scotland? Well, I think, I mean, you mentioned NHS Tayside, and I, th I would say two things that perhaps sound a bit contradictory, but they're not intended to. Uh, we must treat uh, issues like that, which has developed and emerged in NHS Tayside, really seriously. And I hope that, you know, whatever political differences uh, there might be in the chamber, there is an, an absolute recognition that the health secretary and the government has treated that extremely seriously with the actions that were taken to uh, renew and change the leadership of NHS Tayside. Um, and we should never be complacent when we see issues in one health board that they don't exist elsewhere. And that's why if you take the, the issue around endowment funds, for example, the health secretary has gone through a process of asking all health boards to assure her that similar issues are not in other health boards or if they are, what they're going to, to do about it. So we're not complacent about that. On the other hand, and this is 
at the bit I, I don't intend to sound contradictory, we equally shouldn't assume that because we've seen the issues we've seen in NHS Tayside that, that those issues will uh, occur in other health boards. Actually, in, in my experience and some of this, this experience in past years was as health secretary, obviously, the, the governance and the leadership in our health boards is very good and, and very strong. Um, I think, though, that this is not just because of the NHS Tayside situation, but generally because of, and you've mentioned some of this, the, the regionalisation of delivery of some services, the integration of health and social care, the, the general trends around delivery of health care, this is a, an appropriate time to look at governance uh, for, for good, positive reasons. And I, I welcome the work your committee is doing. I think that will be very helpful to the government in terms of uh, making decisions for the future. You are obviously aware that we, uh, in the tail end of last year, uh, also commissioned a pilot review of corporate uh, governance in NHS boards, uh, which is being led by John Brown, who's the, the chair of Glasgow, who's now the interim chair at, at Tayside. Um, and that started in NHS Highland. It's expected that a report of that will publish before the summer recess. So we're looking very closely at these issues of governance, how we make sure that governance in health boards is not just uh, at the standard and quality we expect for them to do their day-to-day -day job. We should hopefully take that for granted. But whether we've got the governance in place that allows health boards working with other parts of the public sector to do some of the transformational work that is needed uh, in the delivery of health care because of the demographic and other challenges that we're all aware of. Thank you. I, I think we're on the same page in terms of recognising that this is a critical time for examining issues around governance. And I wonder in that context, given uh, regionalisation and given the potential impact of the crisis at Tayside on other boards, uh, what uh, the First Minister's views or thoughts are in relation to the accountability of the delivery of those services at a regional level, uh, given that the existing accountability structures are really designed for board by board uh, responsibility to the public? Um, I think, well, again, I, I speak from the past experience of being a health secretary here, and the, the accountability, and Shona Robinson's demonstrated this uh, in terms of an intervention in NHS Tayside, the accountability between health boards and uh, government is very strong. So uh, health secretaries have the ability under the 1978 Act to exercise ministerial powers, and, and that's what the health secretary did last week. Uh, we, we've had some similar uh, reason to think through this in, in the context of integration of health and social care. Of course, there we're dealing with the integration of health boards accountable to ministers and democratically elected local authorities. Um, in terms of regionalisation, the, the building block of that is still individual health boards and that accountability matters with regionalisation just as it does uh, with services that are provided within individual health boards. But increasingly, we are thinking about uh, whether there are changes required. Uh, my my view, and it's, it's not a view that everybody agrees with, um, I think we need to allow regionalisation to evolve um, in the way that it is. I, I'm not, because I, I think it distracts a lot of people in the health service, I, I tend not to be of the view that we should uh, go for hardwired structural changes uh, to embed that in, in a firmer way, which means that the, the health board continues to be the building block so that link of accountability that we have just now continues to be i think the appropriate one but of course as these uh, if, as these issues develop that's something we will learning and listening to the work of your committee continue to consider thank you and i call lastly james dorning convener of education and skills mr dorning please. thank you convener good afternoon first minister uh, the education skills committee is looking at children experiencing poverty and how to support their attainment at schools. A number of submissions received to the inquiry highlight the valuable work community learning and development workers undertake, and this includes linking in with the work of schools through local authorities. Can I ask whether consideration has been given to how CLD workers' links to schools will change under the proposed education reforms? Will, for example, CLD practitioners require to approach individual schools to agree how to support children within these schools, or would they continue to work through local authorities? Well, the, the first thing I would want to say is that CLD workers, in my view, will continue to be really important in providing support to schools. Um, right now, there is no consistent pattern across the country, either in terms of how CLD workers are employed. Some are employed by local authorities, uh, some are employed by voluntary organisations, nor is there 
uh, a consistency in terms of the way in which they, they work. You know, some have got a, a capacity building function, uh, others will work more directly with children and young people. So I think in, in looking at how this uh, will develop in line with the governance uh, reforms in education, we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that there is a sort of consistent arrangement in place just now. I think the governance uh, reforms that we are embarking on perhaps give us the opportunity to, to make that more consistent and more uh, uniform and obviously at the heart of the education governance review is the notion of empowering individual schools and head teachers much more uh, and obviously the uh, pupil equity fund is providing the resources to allow uh, head teachers to decide whether there's particular resource they need to augment what they do and I think uh, CLD workers perhaps will have a more central role as a result of some of that. It's interesting to hear. Thank you, convener. That's interesting to hear that response because I was just going to come on to the pupil equity fund. We were talking about that today, uh, how to target it and its impact was discussed during the session this morning. A number of examples of good practice, some less so, but you clearly see then the bringing of services into schools that uh, are normally developed in community. For example, youth services and benefit services, youth workers and benefit services, uh, using the PEF money as being a positive way forward and something that we should be encouraging. Um, the, the whole um, philosophy behind PEF is that we don't dictate to schools how they use the money. Now, clearly there are resources there in terms of uh, allowing head teachers to look at what works and, and the evidence base of that. Um, but I am very, very clear that we should support head teachers in using their judgment to decide how that money will make the biggest difference to the attainment of the young people in their schools. And yeah, I, I said this in an FMQ session not that long ago. I've seen some examples uh, with my own eyes of how PEF money is being used that I guess there would be some people would raise an eyebrow and say, is that really appropriate? But absolutely it is. If a head teacher can say that it contributes to the, the performance of a school and you know the, the example I gave in the, the chamber was a, a head teacher who'd taken some parents and uh, children away for a, a weekend uh, because he felt that was improving the engagement of parents in the school and the attendance of the young people uh, at the school so if a head teacher thinks the use of the money is, is doing that we should support them in that because the whole purpose of it is to trust the professional judgment of head teachers and the teams they have in place. Can I come back and do it? Thank you. Uh, Thanks for that. One of the things that came up today was that some schools seem to be less well placed to take advantage of the PEF money. And is there any suggestion of, of more information or support being made available to some of those schools to make sure that they know what's out there and how they can use that PEF money to the best of their ability? Well, I, I haven't heard the evidence that, that you're talking about today, so I would be very interested to have a look at that. I, I, as you know, part of the uh, the purpose of the development of regional collaboratives is about making sure that professionals working in our schools have access to the, the best practice, the, the, the interventions and, and that, that are evidence to work. It's not then that we dictate what to, to schools which ones they should use. So there is a, a focus, and, and John Swinney's uh, working hard with the teaching profession on this, is to make sure that, that uh, those resources are available. Um, again, in, in my experience, and obviously I've, I've not visited every school in the country, but the schools I've visited or the head teachers I've spoken to or some of the classroom teachers I've spoken to, I think there's a lot of innovation uh, being used, uh, being applied to how PEF money is being used. Inevitably, as we get more years of experience of using PEF, we will get more of an evidence base building up of what interventions are particularly impactful. Um, and I think it's important that we, we do gather that as we, we go forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I and mean, that concludes questions. I wonder, First Minister, if you want to make any closing remarks. Um, not, not particularly. Um, <laughs> I uh, perhaps saying thank you for uh, allowing me to get out alive. Um, I, I'm happy if there are any final questions convened. I'm looking at the clock. I, I see we've got a few minutes, but. Well, I, I, as nobody, I, nobody asked to ask for a, an extra supplementary, can I just say, and I don't see anybody looking uh, at me asking for one, can I just say thank you very much? But I think apart from questioning your First Minister, it reminds the public of the very crucial role of the committees in this Parliament. I mean, people tend to watch the excerpts on television and the, the more dramatic stuff, but this, the solid work of the committees, which you hear today around this table, really are to be commended in their independence, their scrutiny, and in 
indeed holding the government to account. So I think it's a timely reminder of the work of all the committees of this parliament. We sometimes lose sight of that. So I can thank all my colleagues uh, for their questions uh, and can I thank the public for attending and can I say to colleagues the next meeting with the First Minister as we've decided to do it twice a year will either be in October or November and I now close this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you.